Good evening. Our first song this evening will be number 743. Number 743. We'll work till Jesus comes. Number 743. O oh, land of rest for thee, I sigh, when will the moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home? We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes and will be gathered home. No tranquil joys on earth I know, no peaceful sheltering dome. This world's a wilderness of woe, this world is not my home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. To Jesus Christ I fled for he bade me cease to roam and lean for succor on his breast till he conduct me home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll gathered home. I sought at once my Savior's side, no more my steps shall roam. With him I'll brave death's chilling tide and reach my heavenly home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Please stand for opening prayer. Will you bow with me? Loving Heavenly Father, we're so deeply blessed and fortunate to have the uh, time and the opportunity to come here to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that the things are, that are said and done here this evening will be according to your will and will edify and touch the hearts of all who are here. Father, we pray for your church the world over that as the word goes forth, that many souls will be saved and many will come to you. Father, as we go through tonight, may we always be mindful of those who are less fortunate, those who are unable to be with us for sickness and other cause, and um, we pray that we will reach out, Father, and, and make contact and, and keep those people in our thoughts and our minds and our prayers, and hopefully bring them back to us once more. Father, as we go through this week, guide us, guard us, keep us always in your loving care and forgive us when we stray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Our next song this evening will be number 362. Number 362. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. 
Number three, six, two. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in Thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of Happy rest, thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals, join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. The song for the prayer list this evening will come to 627. Number 627. The Glory Land Way. Number six, two, seven. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow is clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Listen to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wanderers come home, oh, hasten to obey, for I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow is clearer, for I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go, rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. 
Soon I shall see him in that home above, oh, I'm in the glory land way, I'm in the glory land way, I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for, I'm in the glory land way. Good evening, everyone. We need to make an addition to our prayer list this evening. Uh, we found out that Marge Cooper, she's in the hospital uh, with possible pneumonia. So we need to keep her in our prayer. She's in room 302 in Kaiser in Fresno. Not that we can see her because of COVID, but we need definitely to keep her in our prayers. Uh, let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear God and Father in heaven, we're so deeply thankful for this another time we can come together to sing songs of praise and to study more from your word. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with those that are on our prayer list this evening, especially Marge has been added to our prayer list. We pray that you'll, you'll be with each and every one, that you will comfort them, that you'll strengthen them, and that if it be thy will, that you will have them back within our flock. We're so thankful for some of the prayers that have been answered and some of the, the names that have been taken off our list. And, we're so thankful and blessed for that. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with each and every one of us in this congregation as we go out in the world and as, as we are dealing with others that are, that are dealing with other sicknesses that are going on. We pray that you'll keep your healing hand upon each and every one of us. And we pray, Lord, that you'll be with our mission work, that you will guide those who are, who are spreading your word and that will help save more and bring more to you. Be with us now. In Christ we pray. Amen. If you would please mark number 667, number 667, that will be the song after the lesson this evening, number 667, and then after doing so, if you would please turn with me, me. The turn with me to number 48. Number 48. Anywhere with Jesus. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over dearest ways, Anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea, Telling souls in darkness of salvation free, Ready as he summons me to go or stay, Anywhere with Jesus when he points the way, Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know, Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep when the darkening shadows round about me creep. Knowing I shall wake and never more to roam. Anywhere with Jesus will be home, sweet home. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go.
there is at times a problem with closeness. What I mean by that is that especially in religious matters, when somebody's ideas, when their theology, when their reasoning is close, but it's not accurate, it can lead to dangerous situations. It can lead to harm in personal relationships, and more importantly, it can lead people astray when it comes to their relationship with God. These things can take on different forms, uh, whether it be manner of salvation, whether it be uh, manner of worship and things, but it's especially true when we look at Job's friends and their understanding of God's relationship with man, and most specifically, the idea of tragedy befalling people. You see, Job's friend's theology was close, but it wasn't accurate. They even believed at least Eliphaz, the Temanite, as we're going to look at his uh, opening statements to Job, and we begin here the, the really the main portion of the book of Job as Job's friends uh, each take turn really making accusations against Job. And there are truths that they speak, and we're going to highlight those things. But at the base of it, their theology is wrong. Their understanding of how God deals with humanity is wrong, and it's going to lead them to some, well, some wrong conclusions and some hurtful things are going to be said to Job. In addition to that, it's going to make them feel and seem, well, superior. When they, in fact, are the ones that are in the wrong. And so there are a lot of reasons that we have to be careful and we have to uh, maybe most of all be careful that we don't take a step out as these men seem to do and speak for God when he has not given us the right or ability to do so. In chapter 4, uh, Eliphaz the Temanite answers Job, and specifically this is in response to Job's statements that we looked at last week in chapter 3. And he begins in verses 1 through 6, and he's complimentary to Job. And this is another one of those uh, sections that gives us a little bit more insight into who Job is and you know why God thinks so highly of him. In verse 2 it says, If one ventures a word with you, will you become impatient? But who can refrain from speaking? Behold, you have admonished many, and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have helped the tottering to stand, and you have strengthened feeble knees. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? Remember, Job is cursed the day of his birth. He's questioned why God is doing this to him why he has to suffer in this way. And Eliphaz begins and he says, well, Job, you of all people should know. You've been there for others when calamity befalls them. You've been there. You, you, you know God. You know how he operates. And this is the beginning of the betrayal of, well, how wrong Eliphaz's belief in how God operates is. You see, he, he's essentially accusing Job of being two-faced. Of being that righteous, strengthening friend to those who have struggled, to those who have had problems befall them, who have struggled with sin even, only to then when the same thing happens to him, make accusations of wrongdoing against God. Job actually hasn't crossed that line yet, but... That's kind of the picture being painted. And he gets right down to the matter in verses 7 through 11. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright destroyed? According to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they come to an end. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The lion perishes for lack of prey, and the whelps of the lioness are scattered. His accusation in verse 7 is that God does not let calamity befall the innocent. And yet, 
we could go to the very first family to exist and see that his statement in verse 7 is just patently wrong. Abel did nothing and yet was slaughtered by his own brother. God sent a flood upon the world because the mass majority were wicked, but is that to say that every child that died in that natural disaster, supernatural disaster, was wicked? For that matter, is that to say that every person who is mauled by an animal or suffers because of a forest fire or a flood or a hurricane or tidal wave, you name it, that every time something like that befalls someone, it's because they or their household or their city or nation has sinned greatly against God? Now, I will tell you that things... Well, this earth is cursed because of sin. And so many of those natural disasters, yes, you could say, are the result of sin, but not necessarily the sin of those upon whom they befall. We are not guilty of the sins of our fathers. We are not guilty of the sins of Adam but we do bear the consequences. When a doctor or someone of other trust lies and is corrupt and harms people, they're left with scars, are they not? They're left sometimes even with deformities and pain even though they may not have done something wrong. Cain died because of his, or excuse me, Abel died because of his brother Cain's sin. And so yes, you can make the statement that these types of things that happen because of sin, but maybe not Job's, or maybe not insert person here. And he uses this picture of a lion whose teeth have been cut out, broken out. He's, he's accusing Job of being that lion. The one who roared with, with righteousness but now perishes because of his wrongdoing. Because God himself has taken his power and ability away from him. Then in verses 12 through 21 of chapter 4, Eliphaz is attributing a dream that he has to being a vision of God. This is a time when God visiting people and giving people visions wasn't unheard of. But it would seem that he's trying to ascribe maybe meaning to something that didn't have the meaning that he thought it did if it was from God at all. Now a word was brought to me stealthily, and my ear received a whisper of it, amid disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night when deep sleep falls on men. Dread came upon me and trembling, and made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed by my face, the hair of my flesh bristled up. It stood, stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence, and then I heard a voice. Can mankind be just before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? He puts no trust even in his servants, and against his angels he charges air. How much more are those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth? Between morning and evening they are broken in pieces. Unobserved they perish forever. Is not their tank cord plucked up within them? They die yet without wisdom. Now, there is truth in the statement of verse 17. Man by himself 
could not stand before God. Job was a righteous man. Now, this does not mean he was perfect. We even see in the first chapter of this book that he was a man given to making sacrifices in order to atone for sin. But this particular calamity did not become, did not come upon him as a result of sin. But even Job understood that of our own accord, had God not given a sacrificial system in, in years past and now today, the system of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that no, man would have no hope of standing before God. So there is truth there. But see, his application of truth is errant because of his fundamental misunderstanding of God and the situation. For example, in verse 18, he claims that God does not trust even the angels. But we know because, well, of course, we read chapters 1 and 2 already. We have a behind-the-scenes picture that neither Job nor his friends have that God does, in fact, trust the angels. There's even a measure of trust for Satan because God put boundaries and trusted Satan to follow them. And so even there, the fundamental idea of how God sees humanity. Because he says that God does not trust the angels. So how much more is he going to care about us? These little things of clay. And yet we know that God absolutely does care about humanity. Right? Now we have literally thousands of years and two entire legal systems worth of evidence and instruction about the nature of God more than these people. So let's not misunderstand that. But we are told that God knows how many hairs are on our head. We are told that God even notices when the smallest of birds fall. And he absolutely cares about what happens to us. That he does not just watch us, or, un, or excuse me, not watch us as we perish and are broken and die without wisdom. In fact, it's the opposite. God takes great pains and lengths to try to impart wisdom, to give humanity opportunities to know him and to know his ways. And so we see how these things can sometimes snowball, right? It begins with a misunderstanding about how God deals with people that this type of calamity must equal some sort of sin being the root cause. And now it's snowballing into other areas that Eliphaz is speaking for God and just being wrong. Because when our theology, when our understanding, when our study of God is incomplete or wrong, the rest of our understandings are also going to well, be based maybe in inaccuracies or downright falsehoods. And then in chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, Eliphaz, well, he gets right to the point. No more is it even shrouded in these uh, veiled uh, accusations. He just gets right down to it. Call now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? For anger slays the foolish man and jealousy kills the simple. I have seen the foolish taking root and I cursed his abode immediately. His sons are far from safety. They are even oppressed in the gate and there is no deliverer. His harvest the hungry devour and take it to a place of thorns, and the schemer is eager for wealth. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. For man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. It says, Job, who are you, who are you going to call out to? Who is going to be your witness of righteousness? He says, the fools fall in such a way. 
Affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. He's saying these things don't just happen. But sometimes they do. And so even in this very direct accusation, his basic misunderstanding of God is now driving this very large wedge. I mean, if somebody came to you and made such an accusation, it would harm the relationship that you have going forward, would it not? I mean, this is the very idea of the term that we sometimes refer to or call today victim shaming, right? Something happens to someone, oh, you must have brought this upon yourself. How? Then in verses 8 through 16, again, Eliphaz speaks truth, but with the wrong motive. But as for me, I would seek God, and I would place my cause before God, who does great and unsearchable things, wonders without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends water on the fields, so that he sets on high those who are lowly, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the plotting of the shrewd so that their hands cannot attain success. He captures the wise by their own shrewdness, and the advice of the cunning is quickly, quickly thwart, thwarted. Wow. By day they meet with darkness, and grope at noon as in the night. But he saves them from the sword of their mouth, and the poor from the hand of the mighty. So the helpless has hope, and unrighteousness must shut its mouth. There is absolutely hope in God. And what he says here about God saving the helpless and, and lifting up the weak and even making them to be the mighty is absolutely true. But as Paul says in the book of Ephesians, we have to speak the truth in love. This isn't love, this is accusation. He's not saying these things because he's, he's telling Job, look, you can turn to God and he will take you. You're in this terrible state of calamity, but just wait. God takes care of his people. He's saying you need to turn away from wherever you're at and go back to God. Even this promise of hope is an accusation. And so this is a demonstration of, of the fact that we have to be careful because we can even say things that are true, but if we say them with the wrong motives, if we say them without love, without, well, knowledge, they can actually become incendiary. They can actually become painful when these statements, really his statements in verses 8 through 16 are, are beautiful in their picture and portrayal of God. Were it in any other context, it would be a great demonstration of how wonderful a God we serve. But I promise you, these words brought no comfort to Job. And then he closes his statements, at least for a time, in verses 17 through 27. Behold, how happy is the man whom God reproves. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for he inflicts pain and gives relief. He wounds and his hands also heal. From six troubles he will deliver you, and seven evil will not touch you. In famine he will redeem you from death, and in war from the power of the sword. You will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. And you will not be afraid of violence when it comes. You will laugh at violence and famine, and you will not be afraid of wild beasts. For you will be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field will be at peace with you. You will know what is your tent, uh, that your tent is secure, for you will visit your abode and fear no loss. You will know that your descendants will be many, and your offspring is the grass of the earth. You will come to the grave in full vigor, 
like the stacking of grain in its season. Behold this, we have investigated it, and so it is. Hear it and know for yourself. Verse 27 might be the key to understanding all that Eliphaz has said. That he himself is investigated and he knows that this is the way that it is. But how much knowledge can Eliphaz have from looking at the lives of people? I just want you to think, consider for just a moment some of the strange things and especially the atrocities that people have brought upon their fellow human beings. And ask yourself, if you simply made a study of the, quote, average person, would you really think that people would be capable of such things? I mean, I've never met anybody who gave me the slightest indication that they thought locking up six million people in camps and gassing a large number of them to death was a great idea. I've yet to meet anybody who thought that the best thing to do was to simply starve their enemies and commit genocide in that way. Matter of fact, I've never met anybody who ever thought genocide was a good idea. But those things have happened. And it just goes to show that by simply looking around at our own experiences is so limited and so limiting that it's not the way that we should be trusting to build our relationship and our idea of God because God is so much bigger than our little lives, is he not? Now, God is concerned with our little lives. We've already discussed that. But he's also so much more. If we were just to look at, at our lives, I'm sure that there are large pictures and portions of God that would be missing entirely. And that's really the point to Elif, uh, Eliphaz's uh, statements here. Is that because they're based on such a small sample, because they're based on such a, a, a tiny little tunnel a vision, they don't see the larger part of God. They don't see the larger plan of God. I mean, realistically, who could live their life? Let's even use people like Adam and Eve and and others that lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. Who could even really look at their lives and who would have come up From the days of Adam and Eve in the garden, who would have contrived, who would have thought of, well, I know what God's going to do. He's going to come and he's going to die a horrible death for all humanity in person. Nobody, because you know what? I can tell you nobody's ever thought of that because there's not a world religion that's ever thought of that. There's not a single false religion that has ever come up with the idea that maybe, just maybe, the gods of the earth will die for people. In fact, it's always the other way around. And so we have to be careful. We have to be careful, as as we've mentioned, that we don't speak for God when we don't have the right to. We have to be careful that we don't try to put God in a box, as we've mentioned before, that we don't overly humanize God. We are made in his image, but let's not think that that means that God is like us.
We have to make sure that, yes, we speak truth. Eliphaz speaks truth in a number of places here. He's not entirely missing the idea of how great and wonderful God is, but he's missing enough key pieces that really his theology is dangerous. So we have a duty to seek, to seek God and to better understand him and to better teach him. To make sure that when we talk about how wonderful God is, that he does send rain and water on the earth and that he does lift up the helpless, that they're words of comfort. Not accusation. That we let people know that we do not stand a chance on our own of standing before God and being found righteous, but that doesn't mean that we cannot stand before God without fear. Because we absolutely can. Not of our, of our own accord, but because God has given us a way. Because God has always given humanity a way to atone for sin. And especially because he sent his son to die for us. And his statements about what will happen to the righteous are absolutely true. God will protect us. God will bless us. He will remove fear. He will give us security. And he will help us to confidently walk through life even to the point of death. Because God is good. So let's make sure that we're giving people the right picture. If we can help you tonight, if maybe you feel a little bit more fear than you, than you should about standing before God. If you'd like to have a little bit more of his peace, comfort, security. If you'd like to know the, the great and wonderful and loving God that showers all blessings upon this earth, let us help. Let us be a source of strength and comfort and encouragement this evening. Let us help you in your walk with God, if in any way we can, as we stand together and as we sing. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. whiter than snow there's power in the blood power in the blood since saints are lost in its life-giving flow 
There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Please be seated. Is there anyone who is not here this morning and is in need of communion? Do you have? ask a blessing on the bread. Father, we pray that you bless this bread that the one partakes of now in memory of your son's body that hung on the cross carrying our sins. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Join me in asking a blessing on the cup. Father in heaven, we pray that you bless this cup and the one who partakes of it as a way of remembering the blood of your son that was shed on the cross to forgive our sins. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Few announcements. Winter camp at YBC, February the 19th through the 21st. Um, registration forms are at your church website or um, Facebook. I knew there was another place. There's a men's meeting tentatively for February the 8th and then um, at 7 p.m. in the fellowship hall. And a birthday fellowship is going to be uh, February the 13th. It's going to be scheduled for, for after the morning services. And uh, there's some things that, that we're going to talk about. Um, Woodward Park, February the 25th. The singing there, it's uh, at 7 o'clock at Woodward Congregation. Woodlake. Woodlake. Woodward starts with a W. <laughs> Woodlake, sorry. Can't read my own writing. Um, is there anything else? If you'll stand, we'll be dismissed. Shall we pray? Almighty Father God in heaven, Lord, we are so grateful that we can gather here this evening as your children to hear a portion of your word, Lord. We, we know that you're in charge. We know that everything that happens is, is through you, Lord. We, we know you protect us from the evil one, and we thank you so much for that. Lord, we ask that you continue to guide us and to lead us in a path that brings us closer to you, Lord, and helps us to, to bring other people closer to you. Lord, we're so grateful for the people you put in our lives that help us along the way to be better Christians. Lord, keep us safe and be with those who are unable to be here this evening and, and help them to, to feel better and, and be better and, and join us again. Lord, guide us in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.